So welcome everybody back to A World on the Move. It's a great pleasure for me today to introduce the Director General of IOM, William Lacey Swing. First of all, let me turn to the DG and ask you to talk us through a little bit what it means for IOM to now be part of the UN family. The time had come when we should, for the sake of migrants and the interests of the member states and for the organization, that we should go into the UN. Migration has become a global issue. It is a mega trend of our century. So we are on the ground able to help migrants and to help member states to manage migration in a more humane, safe, dignified, responsible manner than otherwise would be the case. As you say, the humanitarian intervention, resettlement can have really positive outcomes. And we can see that, I think, with our guests today. Uh, the, the, the life story of each of you is really particularly poignant and interesting. In my experience, I've, uh, everything that I've experienced is related to the, the perception or the experience of a youth. The part that youth have to play in, the, in this current crisis or the, uh, the, the, the kind of the solution should uh, take into account the huge, huge, huge number of youth that are affected by these conflicts. And these are individuals like myself, younger and older, that, you know, just really, really are yearning to be empowered. They have, have these skills. A lot of, uh, a lot of migrants are uh, graduates. A lot of migrants are, com are incredibly, incredibly edu educated um, as international organizations. I think something that the IOM does that's really, really powerful is that, um, you know, they provide aid um, that helps individuals come back on their feet so they can provide for themselves rather than just continue to provide aid. You, you yourself have, have made a very, a very powerful statement, and I hope that other youth will also speak up. There are a number of issues here. One is uh, we need to constantly be working on some of the root causes of forced migration. A lot of youth are being forced to migrate simply because the job opportunity is so limited. The number of unaccompanied youth that are coming into Europe is at an all-time high. When I came into this position in 2008, one country uh, with a large population was telling me they had 9,000 unaccompanied minors there and they didn't know what to do. Today, another much smaller country has 32,000 who are undocumented, who have no identity papers at all. Even though they have a talent, they have a good education, a good background, a lot of work experience, but out of desperation, they take off on the migratory route without any protection. 40 years ago, my nightmare ended. The nightmare of being on the streets of Chile where I have been since the military coup in September 1973. My father was arrested, taken from me, and I needed to survive alone on the streets for three years. What I always remember when I think of those days is the feeling of solitude, or the solitude of that boy, the 12-year-old boy, the 13-year-old boy, the 14-year-old boy, the 15-year-old boy, lonely trying to find solutions. And that solitude is that today, in today's world, is shared by millions of people and young people in the same situation. Children in crisis, they are very often ignored by adults because adults are submerged in pain, in sorrow, in misery. They don't pay attention to the emotional solitude of children. And that is something that we need to do because, you know, we hear today that millions of children are out of school because of displacement crisis or migration crisis, poverty because of bad migration. And we need to send signals to those children. When I was on the streets of Chile, living literally from mouth to mouth, someone said in one newspaper that he received a prize of something and he said, I dedicate this prize to the children of Chile who are in a difficult situation. And I looked at myself and I said, is he talking to me? And I, and I said to myself, yeah, perhaps he is. And that helped me to understand that what was happening to me was not the right thing. I didn't deserve it. It was something else waiting for me. So when you send signals of hope to children like that, someone will be listening to you. And that children, that child, will be hoping for something better to happen to them. As you know, uh, we now have unbroken, simultaneous, uh, complex, protracted humanitarian emergencies and crises 
from the western bulge of Africa well into the Himalayas. We've got eight or nine crises at the same time, and we have to be active there, trying to help people caught up just as you were. Many of them uh, IDPs, internally displaced persons, moving around desperately looking for some kind of refuge and support. And if we don't, if we do that and we do it well, I think then uh, the decision to go into the UN will have been more than justified as we try to work together and strengthen the coherence of our approach with all of the UN agencies working in cohesion together to address these awful situations. I moved right after the coup had happened, a military coup in Fiji, and right after uh, 9-11 had just occurred in the United States. So it was it was an interesting time for me to transition to the U.S. Um, one of the biggest things that I've seen, especially after working in the field of migration and continuously, has been the integration process for young individuals. I myself came at such a young age and saw that the system had... I was completely lost in the system in the US. You know, I saw my fellow colleagues and my classmates move forward in education and all that, but I wasn't familiar with any of this. You know, my parents are immigrants, I'm an immigrant myself, and it felt as if it was a setback. No, thank you very much. Again, you've put your finger on a very uh, major issue in migration today. The first thing is we need to make sure that there is a language learning program for migrants. You have to have the language if you're going to succeed locally. Related to that is immediately to get into the job market to hopefully host officials will help put people into jobs. But with the language and the job at that point, you're no longer a refugee, you're no longer a displaced person, you're no longer a migrant. You're part, you, then start, you start paying taxes and soon, pretty soon you'll be a citizen, you can be, be voting. So these are empowering moves. So it's extremely important that those two things happen. And there's a third thing that has to happen. We have to bring the local community into this and seize them with their responsibilities for helping you to integrate uh, into the community. Much of what we've seen, some of the bad things that have happened over the past year, are all a result of failed integration efforts. Either no effort was made or it wasn't inadequate. So I would say language learning, jobs, and educating the local community and helping them to see the advantage that they have of giving this person the chance to succeed, getting them into the public services. We want healthy migrants so they should have access to medical services. We want educated migrants so they should be given access to our schools. These are all proven examples of what works with integration. Well, thank you very, very much, TG. Thank you so much to all our guests. It's been a real pleasure and we look forward to having you back on this show in the near future.